This episode is made possible by the realistic online game War Thunder. Check out this game through the link in the description below. Go through that link and you not only support this show, but you also get a free premium tank or aircraft and three days of premium time as a bonus. And let's get into it. Here's the only person whose baby picture was flown into space and whose body has been preserved for decades after his death. He pushed his version of communism so far and for so long that he was able to overthrow the government of the largest country in the world. To some, he's a hero. To others, he is one of the most evil villains in history. In today's biographics video, we're talking about Vladimir Lenin, the man behind the Bolshevik Revolution and the founder of the Soviet Union. The year was 1870, and Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov was born in a Russian provincial town called Simbirsk. He would later grow up to be known by his alias Vladimir Lenin, and we're going to explain that later in the video. Most revolutionaries, they've got this tragic backstory of a young life of hardship, rising from the lower classes to demand better treatment for the downtrodden. And many people are taught that this is the case with Lenin as well. They try to say that his parents were descended from serfs, and that he had to study hard to break into the middle class. But the truth is that Lenin's parents they were actually financially comfortable, and by all accounts, he had a happy childhood. His mother, Maria, she was descended from a wealthy Jewish family who was Swiss-German, so she taught him French and German at home. His father, Ilya, was the director of public schools for the entire province. They were considered to be hereditary nobility, and they were far more educated than the average Russian. This placed his parents in a group called the Intelligentsia, who would debate over philosophy and politics in their spare time. Many of the members of the Intelligentsia became politicians who helped shape the new laws of the nation, while others devoted their life to pushing for a Russian revolution. Vladimir and his older brother Alexander they were no exception. His brother loved studying science in high school, but there were no opportunities to become a scientist in this small Russian village. So Alexander moved to St. Petersburg to attend university. During this time, he joined a political study group, and they began to discuss the failures of the Romanov Empire, and they believed that the only way to save Russia would be to remove them from power. When he was 21 years old, Alexander joined a terrorist group who attempted to assassinate Tsar Nicholas II with a homemade bomb. The terrorists, they were caught, and Alexander and his friends, they were hanged for their crime. Vladimir Lenin was 17 at the time that his brother died, and he was just about to graduate from high school. Even though he had gone through such a shocking tragedy, he still managed to become the valedictorian of his graduating class. He went to law school with the intention of becoming a lawyer, but just a few months into his first semester, he joined a demonstration of students who were protesting against the school rules. Since the Russian police were already watching Lenin closely to see if he was also a terrorist like his brother, the school saw his participation in these demonstrations as a sign that he might cause a lot of trouble in the future. So he was expelled, and he decided to educate himself instead. The Tsar, Nicholas II, he released the peasant class from their serf status, meaning that they no longer had to be indentured servants to wealthy landowners. While this helped relieve the difficulties of a lot of people, it wasn't really a perfect solution to the problems that this peasant class were facing. People, they were still in debt, and many struggled to just make ends meet. The vast majority of people, they were illiterate, and Russia was decades behind in progress compared to the Western world. Many members of the intelligentsia, they were unhappy with the way things were going and wanted their country to move forward with progress, just like the rest of the human race. Lenin, he studied law at school, but he realized that with his bad nerves and his family's bad reputation from his brother being a terrorist, it would be impossible for him to get a job as a lawyer. Vladimir Lenin, he began his self-education by reading Karl Marx and other revolutionary writers. He joined a Marxist study group where intellectuals met and discussed philosophy and the possibility of a Russian revolution. It was around this time that a major famine spread throughout the lands near his home. Records of the 1891 famine, they vary drastically, some say, that there were 300,000 deaths, while others say it was closer to 5 million people. Lenin, he was fine, of course, his family, they were well off, and he had plenty of money to buy food. But he also did nothing to aid the people who were dying around him. He was actually kind of happy about this, saying that the worst things got in Russia 
the better it would ultimately become. He knew that people needed to start dying in the thousands before people would be angry enough to want a revolution. Karl Marx wrote that he believed an industrialized society would be the most likely to create a revolution because he believed that they'd want to rise up against commercialism. Vladimir Lenin rewrote a lot of what Marx was actually saying. Lenin wrote the idea that the revolutionary intelligentsia will guide the uneducated peasants. Even though the philosophy was labeled as Marxism all throughout the reign of the Soviet Union, it is now called Leninism because it really was his own personal ideas and not those of Karl Marx. Lenin joined a socialist group that gained access to a factory. There, they started handing out flyers to factory workers. They were trying to make people angry about their work situations and wanted them to demand shorter hours and higher pay. They were caught, though, because they accidentally let a police informant join the group and they were all arrested. At this time, any form of revolutionary activity was taken very seriously and they all had to serve jail time. He was 26 years old at the time he went to prison, but it was nothing like what we'd imagine a Russian prison to be. Since he was descended from a noble bloodline, he was given a very comfortable place to live where he could wear whatever clothes he wanted, as well as read books, and he also received daily visits from his family and friends. He was even allowed to continue writing his revolutionary pamphlets and essays while he was behind bars for that very activity. After just 14 months in jail, he was exiled to Siberia for three more years. In a way, though, this was actually a good move for him. He was given a government pension that covered his living expenses. This meant he spent most of his time reading and writing about the revolution, which is what he would be doing anyway. So for him, this time in Siberia was more like a very long writer's retreat, and he was actually very productive during his time away. Indeed, his girlfriend was also arrested and sent to Siberia as well. They got married there so that they could live in exile together. So Vladimir Lenin, he's writing these revolutionary ideas in Siberia, and he's sending them back to his socialist friends who were publishing his essays in a secret newspaper. He made up a variety of different pen names so that it seemed like multiple intellectuals were all pushing for the same revolution, but really it was just him. The pen name he eventually stuck with was Vladimir Lenin, which is what he is remembered as today. After being released from his time in exile, he was 30 years old, and he and his wife moved to Munich, Germany, where they could print revolutionary newspapers in Russian without getting into trouble with the German police. He would then have the papers smuggled into Russia with the help of fellow revolutionaries who carried them in their luggage. One of these co-conspirators was a young man named Joseph Stalin, who was equally passionate about the coming revolution and would eventually take Lenin's place. Now, just before we get into the next part of Lenin's life, I do want to mention today's sponsor, War Thunder. War Thunder is a realistic, free-to-play vehicle combat game. And I know that the advert in the middle of the video is not ideal, but we can't do subjects like this without sponsors. This video has themes that YouTube advertisers just don't really like, so without a sponsor, we can't really pay for it. So thank you for watching this. Now, this sponsor is also free, it's also a game, so that's also pretty great. Now, it always amazes me when I hear that there are millions of players of these online games, millions, so it's a lot of people, but then I can see why. It's amazing what games can do these days, especially free games. It's free to play, it looks incredible, just look at the footage we're showing here. I mean, why not? In this game, there are over 1,200 historically accurate vehicles. There are tanks, aircraft, ships, incredible vehicles from the 1930s onwards. So this game is available on PC, PS4, and Xbox One. So join us on the battlefield for free using the link below. Doing that supports this show, and it also gets you a free premium tank or aircraft and three days of premium time as a bonus for registering. In most tellings of the Russian Revolution, Vladimir Lenin's rise to power always seems very straightforward. He is always depicted as a well-respected intellectual who was able to rise to power almost immediately. But that's pretty far from the truth. His revolution, it was a long process, but he never gave up trying to slither his way into a place of power. Vladimir Lenin, he had a real talent for stirring up trouble. Even among the intelligentsia, he would call anyone who disagreed with him his enemies and the sniveling bourgeoisie. Even though they were all middle-class socialists, he had absolutely no patience for anyone who did not agree with him 100%. 
During one of their meetings to discuss their strategies about the revolution, he insulted some of the socialists so strongly that they got up and left. While they were gone, he declared that his ideals were the Bolsheviks or the majority, while everyone else was the Menshevik or minority party. The name Bolshevik had stuck from that point on. So in 1904, Lenin he gets a bit stressed out from all of this debating and discussing his philosophy, as well as handing out pamphlets and stuff like that, and he got rather ill. He decided to take a year-long hiking holiday in the Swiss Alps with his wife, but the Bolsheviks they continued their own revolutionary work while he was gone. In 1905, there was a peaceful protest in St. Petersburg in front of the Winter Palace. People held up signs pleading for better working conditions. All they wanted was an eight-hour workday. They even sang God Save the Tsar to show their love and support for the royal family. But instead of listening to their request, Tsar Nicholas II ordered his guards to shoot at the crowd. Thousands of people died, and it became known as Bloody Sunday. People they were outraged, and they began protesting for workers' rights all across Russia. When Lenin heard the news, he abruptly ended his vacation in Switzerland and decided to come back to Russia. He finally had the opportunity that he had been waiting for. He began to preach to people that they needed to organize and take action against the Tsar. He got a little too excited about the idea of a bloody revolution and wrote how they should pour hot acid onto the royal guard and got into specific details of how to murder someone, which was something that no other revolutionary writer had done before. However, there were still not enough revolutionaries willing to fight and kill people on Lenin's behalf. Many of the Bolshevik revolutionaries they were exiled to Siberia, and Lenin fled to Switzerland before he could be arrested too. Then World War I rolls around, and that basically puts a damper on everyone's revolutionary plans. Tsar Nicholas II he left St. Petersburg to join his men on the front lines. The Tsar also left his wife Alexandra in the care of their spiritual advisor Grigory Rasputin. This man believed that he was the second coming of Christ and believed that he had magical healing powers given to him by God. Many of the decisions that Rasputin made were harshly criticized, like putting his unqualified friends in powerful positions. If you want to learn more about Rasputin, by the way, we did a video about him. Find a link to that below. Lenin still continued to write about his revolutionary ideas from Switzerland and encouraged soldiers to turn their guns against their officers during the war. But almost no one was actually reading the underground newspapers except for the handful of active Bolsheviks. The vast majority of the Russian people were eager to defend their country, but the war it was still a disaster. Millions of people died, inflation ruined Russia's economy, and women were standing in long red lines. Tsar Nicholas II renamed St. Petersburg to Petrograd as a symbol of his devotion to the Russian people. For years, people had criticized the name St. Petersburg because it sounded too German and Petrograd was much more Russian-sounding. Tsar Nicholas believed that this would somehow prove his loyalty, but the gesture it just wasn't enough. For the first time, thousands of Russian people were trained in the military, and they knew how to use guns. Soldiers and police officers were just as angry as the rest, and people were swarming the palace to take over from the Tsar all on their own. And Lenin? Well, he had nothing to do with it. He wasn't even there. He was still in Switzerland, and he was panicking because the revolution it was starting without him. The political parties were split into two groups, the Provisional Government, which was made up of the representatives called the Duma, and the Workers' Soviets, who were controlled by the trade unions and made up of the peasants, soldiers, and factory workers. Lenin knew that he was no match for the Provisional Government's leader, Alexander Kerensky. He was a seasoned lawyer and a master of public speaking. Kerensky resonated with the Duma, and since Lenin was not actually a lawyer, he knew that he would lose in a political debate against him. So, therefore, Lenin focused his efforts on trying to manipulate the left lesser educated workers Soviets instead. When he arrived at the train station, Lenin's friends were there to greet him, and he hardly said hello before standing on a pedestal to shout at the crowds that they had done an awful job with the revolution, and that it wasn't going to be over until they took down the provisional government. Almost no one actually agreed with him, and they just carried on going about their business. Even his fellow Bolsheviks no longer wanted to print his essays because it was such an unpopular opinion. The provisional government was leading Russia back to war against Germany, and world War I, it was still going on. But soldiers, they were not happy to serve. It was the reason why they had overthrown the Tsar in the first place. People wanted the war to be over. Many of them abandoned their posts on the battlefield or completely refused to go in the first place. Lenin, he tried to stand up again and lead these crowds of peasants, but someone from the provisional government shouted that he was a German spy. This made the crowd turn against him and he had to run away. Alexander Kerensky could see that he was going to cause a lot of trouble for the authority of the provisional government, so he outlawed the existence 
influence of the Bolshevik party. Lenin, at this point, he needed to escape. He put on a bad wig, shaved his beard, and got on the next train to Finland. Vladimir Lenin, he spent a very long time hiding on a Finnish farm, continuing to write his ideas and send them back to Russia. Since no one was actually listening to him or agreeing with his ideas, he decided to take Russia by force. One night in October of 1917, he snuck back into Russia and met up with his comrades in Petrograd. By this time, he had convinced more members of the Workers' Party to join his side. He convinced his Bolshevik followers of the Red Guard to break into the Winter Palace for a coup d'etat. They captured members of the provisional government at gunpoint. The Duma, they were arrested, taken to jail, and Vladimir Lenin became the new leader of Russia without ever being voted in. Vladimir Lenin addressed the crowd of Russian peasants the morning after storming the Winter Palace and introduced himself as their new dictator and the leader of the Soviet Union. Lenin promised them exactly what they wanted, and he did it in the simplest words possible. Peace, bread, and land. One of his first acts as leader was to end the war with Germany. People were happy because that's exactly what they wanted all along. Right from the beginning, he isolated himself at the Kremlin in Moscow so that he could continue writing. The Bolshevik party, they wasted no time in spreading propaganda that Vladimir Lenin was like a kind old grandfather who only wanted the best for the Russian people and that they didn't have to worry about anything anymore. Everything was going to be fine. Old granddaddy Lenin was going to take care of you. In reality, though, he was bloodthirsty, and he wanted his revolution to be as violent as possible. He told tenants to kill their landlords and encouraged violence against the upper classes. He gave out the order to his Red Guard to remove the Romanov royal family from their palace. At that time, the number of men who joined in Lenin's Red Guard had grown to 200,000, and he had a small army to stand behind him. Many of the Russian people, they protested because they loved the Romanovs, especially the young children. At first, Lenin lied, saying that they would be kept somewhere safe. But once he realized that they were too much of a threat to his power, he ordered their execution. Since the family was being held in Siberia, it took a very long time for the public to learn about their deaths. At first, people believed that it was just Tsar Nicholas who was killed and that the women and children were spared. It would take years for the public to learn the truth of his brutality. He proclaimed that every Russian citizen should have good rations, but in order to do that, the farms would have to be controlled by the government. Farmers were not allowed to keep or sell the food they grew, and all of the crops were spread out among the entire nation. People could no longer choose their jobs and were given employment in newly constructed factories based on the needs of the country. Now, some people were happy about this, and it gave them a sense of security. Indeed, statues of Lenin were erected around Petrograd, and many people called him a hero. Now, not everyone was drinking Lenin's Kool-Aid, though. Plenty of people were furious with him for ordering the death of the innocent Romanov children. In 1918, a woman named Fania Kaplan attempted to assassinate Lenin. She shot him twice at close range. Now, he was seriously injured, but he still managed to survive. Kaplan was arrested, and she refused to give up the name of any of her co-conspirators. She was executed in September of that same year. Lenin would recover from his injuries in the hospital, but from that day forward, he showed no mercy to anyone who expressed even the smallest opposition to his rule. Even though he always encouraged the peasant class to stand up for their rights and rebel against their government, it was no longer okay to do so once that was his government. Anytime peasants or farmers tried to protest against his new rules, they were killed without mercy. Those who opposed Lenin didn't go down without a fight, though. In 1918, a group called the White Army battled against the Red Army in a civil war, fighting to take down the Soviet Union. However, the White Army was not organized very well, and they lost the war. In 1920, farmers were angry that their grain was being stolen from them for the greater good of the communist nation. This began what is known as the Tambov Rebellion, but they were all gassed by the Red Army and their crops were taken away from their dead hands. At least 50,000 people were interned, mostly women, children, and the elderly, some of them sent to camps as hostages. There were several other incidents like this, and any rebellion among the Russian people it was quickly squashed. Even after trying to make his political philosophy work through threats of death and destruction, Lenin knew when to call it quits. When millions of people were on the brink of dying from drought and famine, he decided to temporarily stop communism and allowed farmers to keep the food that they planted and sell the excess food for profit. You know, that's something called capitalism. Unsurprisingly, this was a huge success. People were no longer starving and the economy improved. Once things had stabilized again, Lenin went back to forcing food rations. Unfortunately, not every leader who followed in Lenin's footsteps knew when to take a break from communism during a time of famine. Lenin's successor, Joseph Stalin, would be remembered as one of the worst dictators who ever lived for this very reason.
When he was in his 50s, Vladimir Lenin's health began to decline, and he had multiple strokes. But even when he was in poor health, he was trying to write in his journal to give commands from his bed. When he died in 1924, people were shocked, as they were not expecting him to die so young. Hundreds of thousands of people showed up to his funeral, even though it was below freezing temperatures. People were sobbing, upset that the one man who truly cared about them was gone. He did manage to make some improvements in the economy, and there was so much pro-Lenin propaganda that had been circulated that people believed that he truly was their savior. Five days after Lenin passed away, the city of Petrograd was renamed Leningrad in his honor. His body was embalmed so that people could continue to visit him and pay their respects. Vladimir Lenin's reputation had only became more powerful after his death. He was like a legend who managed to change not just Russia, but several other countries throughout the world. Communist leaders looked to him for inspiration on how to run their own dictatorships. The USSR continued for decades after his death, and despite all of its setbacks, the system led to more progress than Russia had seen in hundreds of years. Before Lenin, the country was very far behind the rest of the Western world in terms of industrialization, education, and modernization. If it were not for all of the reforms made by the Soviet Union, they may have never gotten so far with the space race against the United States, and they still might be lagging behind today. In 1991, the Soviet Union it collapsed, and all of the statues of Lenin they were torn down. Instead of seeing him as a hero, he is now remembered as a villain. Leningrad became St. Petersburg once again. There is no telling how far the nation would have progressed if it were not for the creation of the Soviet Union, but one thing is for sure. Without Vladimir Lenin, the world would be a very different place today. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below and don't forget to subscribe. Also, if you're looking for something else from me, why not check out my other channel called Today I Found Out. We do daily fact videos. You'll find that linked to below. And as always, thank you for watching.